Welcome to the second part of lecture 16 for chemistry 418. This lecture describes the radiochemistry that occurs in nuclear reactors. In part one, we described some basic concepts of nuclear reactors and went over some little bit of detail about the different types of reactors. In part two, we're going to talk about the speciation of isotopes within a radiated fuel how information on isotopes can be used to describe behavior of reactors, and then we're going to describe some overview of fission product chemistry. Here's a picture of a reactor. This is a research reactor, and this blue glow that is around the reactor, this is Shrankov radiation, and Shrankov radiation occurs when particles travel faster than the speed of light within that media. So in this case, the particles that are coming out from the uh, reactions occurring in the reactor initially travel faster than the speed of light they, they get blue shifted so you see this shrink of radiation you can also see this radiation uh, with spent fuel the particles coming out from the spent fuel as it's in a coolant pool particularly when the fuel is recently removed from the reactor will also have a glow not as intense and shrink of radiation is also used as a detection method where particles traveling through the media will provide this shrink of radiation glow, and it can be detected. The fission process is necessary in reactors for the production of heat and the ultimate production in electricity. The fission process is also the source for the introduction of other elements into the fuel, whether they be fission products or actinides through capture. Now in the fissioning process, and we reviewed this earlier, uh, fission products will recoil about 10 microns in UO2 with a diameter range of about 6 nanometers. So imagine that there's not a lot of straggling, very uh, little uh, distribution um, along the, the width of this recoil. So this, and this happens to be of the size of a UO2 crystal. Uh, we already talked about Frankel pair production. Um, there'll be defects that'll be formed. And there's some effects on this process on materials. One is radiation-induced creep, which is shown here. Creep, there's no volume change. There is a shape change. So imagine that something that would look like this can elongate. And this can happen with some, uh, for instance, uranium metal, where if it was in cladding, it could elongate and breach the top of the cladding. Another effect is swelling. This is a volume increase. And this would be, uh, so a cube here would just increase in size. This could be due to the fact that lattice, within the lattices, you would have defects that would increase their size and swell the material. Another process that occurs in fission is relatively local high temperature. The temperature of, at, the, at, the, at the coolant cladding interface can be on the order of hundreds of degrees where the local temperature of fission can be on the order of 3,000 degrees. We've already talked about some other processes associated with, the, with fission in fuel, delayed neutrons, and um, the fact that some neutron, uh, some products will, some fission products will undergo neutron capture. So this kind of changes their decay in the sense that if we were to look at a fission product, and I wanted to understand how its behavior and how much would be left at the end of a radiation, I would not only have to include its decay constant, so a saturation type effect to understand how it would decay as it was being made, but also the fluence of the neutrons and its cross section because some of that fission product will capture neutrons and be transformed into other isotopes. So you have a decay effective, which is one based upon its regular uh, decay constant, and then two, its cross-section with the neutrons in the material. So that will have an influence on the amount of a certain isotope, a fission product isotope, and if we're talking about amounts and material properties in chemistry, concentration effects can come into play about what is produced in the material. As we discussed earlier in the lectures on reactors, burn-up is an important measurement, and it basically is used a way to determine how much energy is extracted from the fuel. It could be terms in the percentage of the atoms that underwent fission, which is often done for fast reactors, 
or the actual energy release per mass of the initial fuel, which is done for light water reactors, and you get measurements in gigawatt days per metric ton or megawatt days per kilogram, and the units are shown here. A relationship between this is 1 MeV is equal to 4 times 10 to the minus 23rd megawatt hours. So there are some relationships uh, with burnup as far as um, what one can uh, look between these two burnup relationships. If I were to completely burn up uh, my fuel in a light water reactor, the typical burnup would be 1,000 gigawatt days per metric ton heavy metal. Reactors are not, don't, don't come anywhere close to this value, and that's one of the reasons that reprocessing, reprocessing of this fuel is of interest to try to achieve more energy utilization out of the spent fuel. Burnup can be determined either through calculations or through measurements. So what one can do is find residual concentration of the fissile nuclides in the fuel after the irradiation. So if I know how much uranium-235 I have in the fuel initially, and I measure the amount of uranium-235 that remains, I can determine the burnup. For instance, with the uranium-235, however, you would also have to account for the neutron capture on the uranium-235, so you'd have to look at the amount of uranium-236 that's also present. Since some, if I just measured the initial and final amounts, the final amounts uh, would uh, be the difference between the initial and the amount of uranium that fissioned plus the amount of uranium-235 that underwent uh, neutron capture. If you knew the neutron energy and the cross-sections, you can also use the cross-section ratios between fission and capture to calculate that amount. Or what you could do is find a fission product concentration in the fuel that is a suitable indicator for burnup. This would have to have a half-life that would be relatively easy to measure, not too short, not too long. And you need to know something about its nuclear data. I would need to know its cumulative fission yield, so I know how much of that isotope is produced per fission, and its neutron capture cross-section, based upon the equation on the previous page, so we would know how much of that isotope had been uh, converted to a heavier isotope in, as it was sitting in the fuel. There are certain isotopes, cesium-137, neodymium-142, and europium-152 are often used as fission products to determine burnup. One can also look for neutron detection to determine burnup. You would need to minimize uh, the influence of curium-244 because it has a spontaneous fission, so you need a, a route to measure the amount of curium-244 in the material. Burnup has an influence on the amount of radionuclides in fuel. We'll start by discussing the amount of actinides that can be in fuel as a function of burnup. And there are a few different types of fuel compositions one would need to consider. Natural uranium, where it's primarily uranium-235, some enriched uranium, shown here, or some MOX fuel, where there's an initial charge of plutonium, also available in the fuel. So this amount of plutonium in the fuel is going to influence the uh, ultimate amount of actinides as a function of burnup. Particularly for americium, there's going to be a notable ingrowth of americium due to plutonium being present in the MOX fuel fat, in, in the MOX fuel. What we see here are some differences in uh, actinide concentration initially. If we look at the top table, shown here, we have no plutonium. If we look at the bottom table, which is MOX fuel, we have an initial level of plutonium. And one of the manifestations of that is the amount of americium. If we talk about grams per kilogram heavy metal as a function of burnup, without plutonium present, we have milligram quantities, whereas if plutonium is present, we have gram quantities. As a fuel undergoes fission, the amount of a given element will vary based upon the burnup of that material. And this is due to the ingrowth of isotopes and the decay of isotopes. So it's a very complicated system. And here's some, um, here's some data as shown for the fission product uh, element concentration in grams per kilogram of heavy metal 
in a radiated light water reactor uranium fuel that's been enriched to 4% uranium-235. And some of the uh, important fission products that we see here include xenon at a low burn-up. It's 2 grams per kilogram of heavy metal, going all the way up to 10 grams. Xenon also has large neutron capture cross-sections, which is responsible for some poison uh, behavior in fuel. After xenon, we would see molybdenum, also has relatively high amounts, again, a gram per kilogram heavy metal at a low burn-up, up to six grams per kilogram at higher burn-ups. Zirconium, again, goes from 1.5 to 6. Cesium, 1.1 to about 5. Cerium, 1.3 to 5. Neodymium from 1.4 to around 7. You see the numbers are fairly consistent but there are slight variations and this is again due to production of isotopes that have relatively short half-lives that are on the time that could be on the time constant of the burn-up of the fuel and then also growth of certain isotopes due to, to decay from shorter lived parents. Now this is for again 4% 235 the, fuel comp the chemical composition of the fuel has an influence. For instance, the ruthenium, rhodium, palladium have higher concentrations in plutonium-based uh, fuel. So there's also a trend where the total activity of fuel seems to be is affected by radioactive saturation, where you get an equilibrium between growth and decay, and you get a maximum that tends to be reached. Now, the radionuclides that are produced are distributed within the fuel. And we'll discuss how they're distributed, and they're not always homogeneously distributed within fuel. As we show here, here's some activity in the fuel as a function of a radial distribution in two fuel types. One is a, a pressurized water reactor, and one is a boiling water reactor. And as we see with the PWR, there's a saturation, a constant level of activity in the middle of the fuel, and towards the edge of the fuel, the activity falls off. In this case, this is done, uh, this behavior is due to neutron shielding effects from spacer grids. So there's a local decrease in fission rates right around the edge of the fuel. There's also some fuel density effects that can influence this behavior. Um, so, for instance, if fuel swells, there's a void, there won't be any fission in a certain area, and you can kind of see some small dips here. If there was a void here, it could be much larger. And also dishing at the end of the fuel, where you get a, the fuel has a concave uh, shape, so you get a void in a certain area. The boiling water reactor shows an asymmetric fuel distribution, and this, for this particular example, this is due to um, control rod positions, so there's fewer neutrons in an area where the control rod is located due to the absorption of the neutrons by that control rod. So not only can we have an axial distribution of, of fission products within fuel, as we showed in the previous slide, but we also get some radial distribution. Now this radial um, distribution of fission products and actinides is mainly governed by the neutron energy uh, flux profile. So fundamentally, it has to deal with neutron reactions that are occurring radially within the, in the fuel. One of the things that we do see is that there is a higher plutonium concentration on the outer zone of the fuel. As shown here, this lighter area, that's where the plutonium tends to reside. And here's a figure that if we see plutonium concentration in the fuel along its radial uh, axis, we see as we get towards the edge of the fuel, so this is measured in microns, and here's the relative amount of plutonium, it goes up right at the edge. And this has to do with the fact that there's epithermal neutron capture on uranium-238 that preferentially occurs on the edge of the fuel. Epithermal are neutron energies that are between thermal and fast. So we get this high degree of capture, we get the preferential formation of uranium, uh, uranium conversion into plutonium. This could also be a route if one wanted to treat fuel, if you could just treat fuel in a radial distribution. For instance, if I knew something about the rate of dissolution of fuel, 
I could preferentially remove the richer plutonium containing segment of the fuel from the overall fuel. There's also a small influence on thermal migration of certain fission products, for instance, cesium or other gaseous and volatile fission products, noble, noble, ga noble elements are examples. There's also influence on the initial fuel composition, as we talked about earlier with uh, some fission products, whether or not there's plutonium so in a MOX fuel. The initial amount of oxygen can have an influence because oxides can be formed and prevent the formation of volatile species. And here's an example of some fission product distribution in fuel. The increase of this plutonium concentration on the rim leads to an increase in fission product density. If I have more plutonium on the rim, I can have more fissile material on the rim. Remember, the initial uranium fissile concentration in the fuel is about 4%. If I start just pr producing plutonium, I'm going to increase the amount of fissile isotopes on that rim, and we actually see some effects with that. And that leads to some increase in fission product densities, and we see this here for cesium. We get a distribution, higher amount on the rim. We also see this for neodymium, higher amount on the rim, and zirconium, higher amount on the rim. Now, one of the differences we see between the neodymium, cesium, and zirconium, the neodymium and cesium, are, uh, excuse me, the neodymium and zirconium are relatively flat until you get to the rim, where the cesium has some character to this, where we see a higher concentration in the center. And again, this could this is due to some volatility behavior of cesium, which we don't see with the neodymium and the zirconium. We also see some behavior with xenon. Now, xenon, we actually see a decrease right on the edge here. And this is due to the fact that xenon is going to be extremely volatile in fuel. And what it'll do, it'll find locations where there's voids and congregate in those voids. There's also some, bur there's also some um, variations in burnable poison, gadolinium isotopes 157 and 155, uh, used as burnable poisons, tend to be depleted in this outer zone. So we'll explore this thermal behavior and distribution in a little bit more detail. And the thermal beha behavior is mainly going to affect gaseous and volatile fission products. As we showed previously, the neodymium and zirconium, which would not be volatile, would not expect to be volatile, aren't influenced um, as much as these gaseous and volatile fission product species. One of the things that we can understand is um, pellet temperatures during the reaction operation will influence the behavior of these materials and also the stoichiometry of the fuel, the role of oxygen in the fuel. If it's UO2 plus X, what X is exactly will have an influence on this volatile behavior. Some of the elements which are particularly um, in addition to the, uh, the noble gases, cesium and iodine have volatility behavior that can follow uh, and use to understand some of the chemical composition of the fuel. Both of them have relatively high fission yields, and they have enhanced mobility within the, fu in the fuel. In most cases, they can be treated similarly, which means that often it, one could imagine that the cesium and iodide could be even transporting as the same chemical form. An experiment was done where cesium iodide was added to UO2, and both elements have the same maximum location at 1,000 degrees. So this behavior, even at 1,000 degrees, was really just driven by the cesium iodide. The cesium and iodide were moving together. If one evaluated UO2 plus X, the iodine property changes. Um, there was mobility to lower regions. And this is because you would have elemental I2 rather than I minus. So the oxygen would help uh, oxidize the, uranium, the iodine keeping it elemental. And this formation changed in the range of X up to 0 0.02. So just a relatively small amount of oxygen can help prevent the mobility of the iodine. Cesium itself um, did not change under these conditions. It remains monovalent and its oxidation isn't going to be greatly influenced by just a small addition of oxygen from the UO2 plus X. You know, what, what also was examined is that the release of cesium and iodine from fuel um, increases with temperature. So if we look over here to temperature and the relative amount of iodine and cesium released from fuel, we get 
but behavior that seems to go down and then spikes as temperature goes above 1,000 degrees. And this, is, this decrease is not observed for the cesium, but the continual increase above 1,000 degrees is shown for both of these elements. Not only do we see the overall amount of material being released, but the release rates um, increase with temperature. If you have a relatively high temperature, you know, 2,100K, there's a very large release rate in a very short period of time, 60 seconds. And we see that both elements can be released at um, significantly faster rates with higher burn-up fuel. Here's an example of uranium burn up at 33,000 megawatt days per ton of uranium and we see that uh, the release of iodine and cesium there's an initial uh, increase and then reaches a uh, the release re reaches a constant rate as a function of time there's somewhat different mechanisms for release and these relate back to um, the behavior of the fuel particularly any damage that was done due to higher burn-up. And some of this behavior also at higher burn-up is attributed to the fission products migrating towards the grain boundaries. Um, we already discussed that the fission products themselves have a travel a distance on the equivalent of a fuel grain boundary. So they don't have to release themselves from the matrix of the fuel. They just migrate from the, bang, the grain boundaries. And also depending upon the fission products that's produced, the UO2 lattice may not be suitable for solubilizing larger atomic radii ions. So we could get different phase formation in the fuel. As the fuel fissions, fission products and actinides are going to be built up in the fuel itself. This could cause the formation of separate phases. Generally speaking, initially when fission occurs, solid solutions are going to dominate because we're going to have a relatively low concentration of fission products. With increasing fission product development and actinide formation, secondary phases are possible. And these secondary phases begin to form when their solubility limits in UO2 are exceeded. One such material is perovskite, shown here as an ABO, where A can be mono or divalent, B are higher sites, higher oxide materials occupy the B sites. And what one could see for an example of a proskite phase shown here, this uh, B site could be occupied by uranium, plutonium, zirconium, molybdenum, and the lanthanides. The A site could be occupied by the divalent barium strontium or the monovalent cesium. When solubility limits of these elements are reached, this material can be formed. For perovskite fuel, the mechanism seems to be driven by the initial formation of a perovskite composed of strontium and zirconium. When this, uh, when this phase is initially formed, eventually lanthanides are added at higher burnup when more of them are made. So evaluation of the perovskite phase can be useful in determining burnup information since the composition of the perovskite will be reflected, directly reflecting the amount of fission products, hence the burnup of the fuel. Metallic phases can also form. These are called epsilon phases, and these materials are composed of the elements molybdenum, technetium, ruthenium, rhodium, and palladium. If one just a cursory examination of these elements on the periodic table, one of the properties is that they tend not to oxidize. So these metals above tend not to form oxides. If we have a limited amount of oxygen in the fuel due to the only fuel, the only oxygen being available due to the UO2 or UO2 plus X, we can uh, expect the formation of these metal phases. And what we see is that the grain size of these epsilon phases are generally around one micron, and their concentrations are nearly linear with burnup. So at, uh, there's five grams per kilogram of uranium at a 10 megawatt days per kilogram uranium burnup, while it goes up to 15 grams per kilogram at 40 megawatt days uh, per kilogram uranium. And as we see here, these phases will form in uh, the 
boundaries between the fuel. And the formation of this metallic phase is promoted by higher linear heat. We see an example here of the heat formate, the Gibbs free energy of the oxidation as a function of heat formation. We can understand some properties of the fuel, one, the relative heat, and two, the UO2 uh, amount. What we see here is this gap in the Gibbs free energy between some of the divalent, trivalent, tetravalent fission products and our fission products that are composed, that compose the epsilon phase material. And what we see here is that depending upon the UO2 plus X, so UO, uh, UO2.05, depending upon where the fuel was burnt, um, composition of material above this line would tend to be metallic and below this line would tend to be oxide. So this gives you a good indication of what sort of composition of the epsilon phase one would expect based upon the initial UO2 plus X of the fuel. Now, molybdenum behavior is particularly strongly controlled by this. If we see the line for molybdenum, we see that it's much steeper than the other elements that are um, shown here. So the, uh, the molybdenum behavior is controlled by the oxygen potential. Basically, the molybdenum tends to be very much in um, the metal if the metal to oxygen ratio is two, and if it's above, if the oxygen to metal ratio is two, and if it's above two, if, the, if, there's, if it's more oxygen, then more of the molybdenum is going to deposit in the UO2 lattice. So an overview of this behavior is shown here through some experiments that were done um, between 1400 and 1800 degrees centigrade. There was just trace amount, there, there was just trace radiation of UO2 material and well, the fission product behavior was evaluated. Four categories were shown from this. You could have volatile fission products, metallic fission products, oxide fission products, there would be separate oxide phases, and solid solutions. Now again, this would tend to be at uh, lower concentrations. But what's shown here is the volatile fission products tend to be the halides, the noble gases, rubidium, cesium. Metallic precipitates, what we discussed from this epsilon phases. Oxide precipitates, so separate oxide phases. These can also include the lanthanides, but those have to be at higher concentrations. And then the green are elements which are going to just form solid solutions with uh, the UO2. What we see is that some of the elements with the highest electric ne negativities have the highest mobilities, and these tend to form these volatile fission species. Some of the lower valent elements, such as cesium barium, tend to have this behavior where they um, form separate species from the fuel due to their low valent cations, and um, their, their oxidation states don't match to the main fuel composition. And then obviously some neutral species will have low solubility, particularly something like xenon. Um, these overall ions with higher charges tend to remain in the UO2. Um, and neutral atoms or monovalent fission products tend to be mobile. And this is particularly evident at higher fuel temperatures. Within this lecture, we reviewed how uranium chemistry is linked with the chemistry in the fuel, particularly the UO2 plus X, how oxidation states of the fission products and the actinides in the fuel influence its behavior. The general trend is the lower the oxidation state, the less it's going to be soluble in the fuel, and what drives the speciation of actinides in the fuel. Fundamentally, how much of, that, how much of the actinides and uh, fission products are in the fuel they form separate phases. Something about volatility, those 
fission products which are volatile, how they behave in fuel, how they can migrate to certain areas of the fuel, how they behave if they, uh, if they get released in the fuel, and also some general trends in the fission product chemistry for groups that are available and how fission products can fall into those groups on their behavior within the fuel, and how some fission products can cross the groups. Some questions you should be able to answer uh, from this lecture. What drives speciation of actinides and fission products in spent nuclear fuel? Well, the amount of fission, the more fission there is, the more the fission products can be involved in the chemistry with each other, and the type of fuel and the composition. So metallic fuel, there won't be any oxygen, whereas with oxide fuel, you can actually have UO2 plus X, so the amount of relative oxygen will slightly change the overall speciation of the actinides and the fission products. So what would be the difference between oxide and metallic fuel for fission product speciation? Well, as we already mentioned, the metallic fuel has no oxygen. So for the metallic fuel, you're only going to have the reaction of the fission products with uranium. So you may make some alloys, or you may make some um, binary phases, or the fission products can start interacting with each other, so you may have things like cesium iodide eventually form and react. And for this question, why do metallic phases form in oxide fuels? It has to do with the oxygen potential. So if you, and the temperature at which the reactor is operating. So the fuel is operating at elevated temperatures, and depending upon the degree of oxygen, available, so your UO2 plus X, you'll be able to get an idea of whether these um, noble metals or these, uh, these metals that form the epsilon phases are going to preferentially form metals if they're above this UO2 plus X line or if they're below it at the given temperature. And how is this, how is the, this behavior related to the TC technetium speciation in oxide fuel. Well again, depending upon where your UO2 plus X lies in the temperature, so for instance if it's UO2.05, when the temperature is below uh, let's say about 800, technetium will be the oxide as opposed to the metal phase. So depending upon where this technetium potential for oxygen lives relative to the donating potential of the uh, oxide fuel, you'll either get an uh, oxygen donated technetium, generally the TCO2, or technetium metal. And often in fuel, you'll see mixtures of those species, particularly for something like molybdenum. When you've completed lecture 16, please comment on the blog and respond to the PDF quiz.